Hello YouTubers, today I want to talk to you about a, uh, a continuation to what I started earlier about uh, how to become a software engineer. This is the second version of a, um, a video that I had published uh, a little while ago. And because a lot of people got interested in that video, I saw that I need to get a little bit deeper and show people you know, how deeply this can go and how you can actually organize your, your life in a very sophisticated way that allows you to actually grow in a specific direction so you would know where you're going. You don't want to be the guy that actually got a job and got a career and then stopped growing. So they're not getting cert certified, they're not working on it, they're not reading, they're not contributing, they're not communicating. They're thinking, look, software cannot be just a job that you go do and then go home and that's it. You need to you need to nourish that. You need to read. You need to uh, uh, grow yourself, get certified and whatnot. And you know, today I'm not just talking about that because I already talked about that in the in the previous video. Today I want to talk to you also about what is the next le level. So I have made all the steps that you asked me. Uh, to get the bachelor degree or the master's degree or PhD, PhD degree. What happens after that? Where are we going with this? So is it just, you know, getting titles and walking around making people feel bad about their lives? Or, or what is it? Like, what is the purpose of this? So uh, I put together a lot of uh, uh, PowerPoint and I hope you guys like it. It, it basically explains from a, a high-level perspective how you can manage your life as a person who uh, wants to approach software engineering, someone who loves computers and technology and purpose and believes that it can make the world a better place, and it actually does. It connects people and whatnot. You want to be a part of that. You just you, you just don't want to be a consumer. You just don't want to be a crafter, someone who just do it as a craft, but not actually interested in what happens to this technology next. Uh, you want to be a seed that grows that tree of goodness and you want to be a seed that actually uh, grows a tree that reaches with its branches all over the world you want to be the person that actually reaches into everyone's life and actually makes it better through technology so let's take a look at this um, a PowerPoint that so there we go. This is how to become a successful software engineer 2.0. And um, to become a soft, successful software engineer, there are very specific steps that I foresee for any anyone who wants to achieve that. And the first thing of all of that is actually uh, to know where you're going. And we have you know, four different stages. These four different stages as are a part of a bigger phase called the getting phase. This is where you start getting from the world. You're not contributing anything yet. You're not, you don't have anything to contribute. You're still filling yourself with information and getting yourself certified to be eligible for the world to actually sit down and listen to you and listen to your ideas. So these four different stages, each one of them have three steps. The first of them all is the studying part. So you want to, you know, do a, to go to school. You already finished your high school. You're starting your school, and the first thing you want to start trying to achieve is to get a bachelor's degree in computer science, and then you do your master's and your PhD. There's something here that's very important to understand. Uh, when you grow this way. At every level you learn more about the universal scientific language of the world. You're learning about different technologies, you're learning about to approach problems from a scientific perspective. So you're actually learning the underlying secrets of a specific technology. You're learning algorithms you're learning what are the algorithms that are used and the things that people use, well, developer use on daily basis, like for each and for loop and do while and whatnot. What is the underlying theory behind this? 
And what's the underlying technology behind this? Because when you know these things, when you grow this way, uh, from a college and, 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 and education perspective, you get to put your two cents in there. You get to be able to improve that and make it better. So going through college, I do not know, uh, at least from my perspective, anything that's higher than a PhD degree in a specific level. But when you become a PhD person, you get to know, like a person that is that holds a PhD degree, you get to actually express your ideas in the most sophisticated scientific way. And from that standpoint, you are very well eligible to start giving back to the world from a theoretical perspective. So you don't really have the practical knowledge that supports that theory that you have. Even though your theory makes 100% perfect sense, and you can express it in a formal way as an algorithm or a mathematical equation, that's cool. But you are a guy that has a PhD degree but has no connection whatsoever with reality. And this is something you may experience in a lot of colleges or universities. You would see that the professors, professors in there, they're actually teaching you the theories, but you feel that their approaches and their input does not have so much connection with what are the problems that people have as in today. So teaching in computer science cannot be just giving out the information that you already studied 20 years ago. It has to be a work on progress where you get to actually get involved into real life products and see the real life problems that faces technology and then pull that on the board in front of your students and you start explaining to them how your science relates to this problem and how your science can fix this problem. This is where you actually create a generation of innovators that actually are capable of critical thinking and changing the problems and actually tackling the problems of the world. Other than that, you will just end up with professors that teaches you COBOL and Perl and stuff like that. So you, you don't want to learn these languages. You want to learn um, you don't want to learn these specific technologies. You want a professor that actually speaks with a technology that's modern, that's up to date, that's cutting edge, at the same time combined with the theory that have been accumulated all these years in order for you to deliver the best knowledge possible. So when you become a PhD holder, you are going through different threads asynchronously at the same time. So let's take a look at that PowerPoint again. So what, what you see here is basically you did the studying and while you're doing the studying you're getting certifications. So you're being certified from a corporate that is specialized into creating the software that says this guy knows that much of software and we believe that he is certified enough to use that technology in order for him to express his thoughts through it. So I'm going to talk to you here from a Microsoft perspective, from a technological part. So Microsoft provides you um, three levels of certifications. So you have Microsoft uh, te uh, te Technology Associate, and you have Microsoft Certified Solution Developer, and then you have Microsoft Certified Architect. These are the three levels that a developer can go through within their career, within their life, um, that actually express how much knowledge they have. So when you get certified, you start by being an associate. You know how to use the technology, but you cannot customize that technology. So you know about C Sharp and the, and the .NET framework, but you don't really know how to use that very same language to implement something that expresses and fulfills the business requirement. When you become a developer, you can do that. And when you become a developer, you are through um, uh, three different levels. So you are a junior developer, mid-level developer, and senior developer. Some people just say junior and senior developer. It, it doesn't really matter. What matters is that you're being certified in order for you to 
uh, connect this theoretical knowledge that you have up here with the practical knowledge that you have down here in order for you to deliver a cutting-edge software. When you become an architect, this is where you have a full understanding of the technology that you're architecting against and then you use the theory, the latest and greatest theories from here in order for you to deliver the best product out there. So from that perspective, you, as you see, these two lines go together. But that's just not the end of it. You start reading asynchronously with these guys. Okay, so you're getting certified, you're reading books, you're doing some practices, you're answering some uh, questions, like uh, choice questions and whatnot. So, all right, you have a grip of what actually the technology utilization look like, and you need to read right next to that. And reading have also three different stages. So there is the remembering. So you only remember the information, but you don't really know how to use that information in the right place because you don't understand. You remember that the .NET framework can create a calculator. You can't use the .NET framework to create a calculator, calculator on the computer, but you don't exactly understand how. So you have all these information that opens the door for you to go ahead and approach the right technology in order for you to reach to the right goal, but you don't really know how. You don't understand it. So the second level of reading, you're not just the person who's just having the book, and just reading from some information that may regurgitate later in some argument in order for you to look good, that's not why you should read. What you really should read for is actually to understand what this book, what this author that gathered all these years of experience and giving it to you through his book, to understand what problem can be solved and what are the problems that can be solved through the knowledge that you got from this book. So this is where you understand that. So at one level you understand this piece, now you get to apply it. So it's very simple that you pick up a book and you read the information in it. So now you remember that information. You took the sample from the book and you started writing your code down. But this is as far as you can go. You can apply it into a real life situation. And this is where the third stage comes, which is applying this knowledge that you have learned. How can you apply this knowledge that you have learned if you don't understand, and how can you understand if you don't remember? So these things are blocks built one over another, just like these guys. You have to go through one in order for you to reach to the next. The last thing in here is contributing. Contributing meaning, means being a part of a, an open source project. And in order for you to be a part of an open source project, you have to learn something from here and here and here. You have to have some idea of how the technology is supposed to work. So when you apply here, you start to actually work on this thread. And when you start as a software developer, like in an open source project or even in a corporate, there are three levels that you go through when you start as just an So the first level is being dependent on others. So you're an entry level or a junior developer, whatever people call it today. You are the guy that actually understands technology and have all these information, but doesn't really have the practical experience and this is why you're there. So you start asking questions to your colleagues, specifically the senior developers. And I would really recommend you, if you're on a corporate, um, choose the one that you trust that knows the most so you don't get misled into whatever information you get. So from that perspective, you start asking questions. So you are dependent as a junior developer, as an entry-level developer. You are dependent on other developers around you to give you back that knowledge. And when they give you back that knowledge, you start to grow that level of practical experience, which is something that you sit next to the certification and the reading and the college degree. All these three guys play a very important role in your practical experience because you get to actually 
argue and discuss the subjects that are being put on the table when you're learning from a senior developer, at least on a theoretical level. So you, you would understand what, why that senior developer told you to solve this problem this way on a practical point, from a, from a practical perspective. So you don't just have blocks of code that you're copying and putting, copying and pasting whatever you see the problem fits. You actually understand, oh, I understand, for example, sorting. So bubble sort, for example. And I want to see how that is being implemented in real life. So I ask that senior developer, hey, I have this list and I want to sort it. And he goes and says, oh yeah, I just use order by in the .NET framework. You can just use order by and there you go, you're ordering it. Maybe the senior developer does not know that you have that theoretical background that says, oh, this is bubble sort. And this is not a binary sort. This is not this kind of sort. So from that standpoint, you can actually improve that piece of code that the senior developer advised you to use to sort faster. And this is where you start stepping forward. And when you start stepping forward, you're already familiar with the technology. You do not need the developers that are around you anymore. So you become independent developer independent junior or senior software developer, someone that doesn't really need much or no help at all in order for, we, for them to implement a specific feature. They already understand the technology, but all what they need to do is what piece of the software we need to do now. So it doesn't really matter what piece of software, you just need someone to lead you to tell you we want to solve these three problems. And you don't really care about how? Because how is you? You are the person who's going to come up with the how to solve this problem or to implement that feature. So at some point you become very familiar with the product that you are not just independent developer that can implement any feature. You become the team lead, meaning a person who doesn't just know the technology and have the ability to go forward with it. You are a person who understands the product from an outsider perspective. So you know what, what is the most demanding feature and what is the most demanding hotfix that you need to implement right away in your product in order for your product to get more users, in order for your product to be more successful, in order for your product to have more market shares. So you become the team lead, the person who just understands the market needs, understands what's going on around you, and then you go ahead and you start developing with the other developers towards this one specific technology and the team lead is so good and sophisticated when it comes to um, choosing the right way to solve a problem so for example you want a combo box a, a drop box that actually shows some lists but because the team lead is very familiar with what kind of users that are going to use that product he would recommend you for example a a, a, a drop-down list that is actually classified. So you have countries, cities, and states, and, and they expand and collapse because he knows that this fits the users the most. So this is from this perspective. So let's go back to the slide. Let's go back to the slide here. So these are these different three levels. Three levels and four different stages into one phase. So when you reach to that level, you become a team lead. You're a guy that applies, not just understands and remember, that actually a guy that is capable of reading a book and actually going ahead and applying what's going on in there. You are actually a guy that is an architect, a person who can imagine the solution for a specific problem and creates a software that fits this level and you are a PhD holder, you get to move to the next level, which is the giving phase. And the giving phase basically is those very same stages, except right now you are the person that actually generates the technology. So you have been the person that actually learns. You have been the person that actually goes and reads the books. So you're reading a product of someone else's thought you are using the .NET framework that is someone else's product 
you are getting a degree that someone else put out there in order for them to see you or uh, recognize you as a person who is capable of approaching technology from that perspective. Now it's your turn to be the person who does that. It's your turn to be the person who actually gives knowledge to others, gives technology to others, train others and certify others on your technology. You become a pillar that actually another pillar in the advancement of the world from a technological perspective. And since technology is getting into every aspect of life, just being advanced from a technological perspective, it means that you are a big piece, a big reason why the world is going forward. So from that perspective, let's look at this slide and see what we have here. So yesterday you were the guy that was actually studying. Now you are the guy that teaches those three levels of students. So at the very beginning, your knowledge is not very rigid. So you want to teach bachelor degree students, students that are pretty much don't have any background about technology. And you want to go ahead, or maybe they have some, but not rigid knowledge about the technology. And you don't want to go ahead and go through that level of mentality. And then you know much about students and you know much about technology that you can teach this level or the next level. So this is how you move forward into that thread. At the same time, you have become knowledgeable enough to create your own technology, to create the next .NET framework, to create the next Java, to create the next uh, 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 PHP, to create the next technology that people actually get. And you know, you might be, you might be smiling or laughing and said, there's no way I can do that. That's exactly how someone else gets to make thousands and millions of dollars and you don't. It's not because they have something you don't. It's because you don't want to believe that you have it. Here's a little advice for you. Everyone in this world has something that everyone else needs. It's your job to find that thing and beautify it and then sell it to the world. And then allow the world to benefit from it. When you become the, te the technology creator, you are helping millions of people finding jobs. You're making millions of families having better lives. When you do that, this is where you actually contribute to the world. And this is where you actually have your signature that says, I am a person who wants to make the world a better place and does make the world a better place. It's so easy to dream it. You can so simply say, oh yeah, I want everyone to be happy. But are you doing anything about it? That's up to you. You have to work so hard in order for you to grant yourself first a better life and then spread that to others. So it's spread that love and goodness and mercy and, 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 and selflessness to others. And this is happening through technology today. Technology became the media the intermediate piece between you and the whole world. I am reaching to you right now through technology. This is what technology can make. So it is your turn when you reach to that level of growth to become the next guy that makes the next Windows, the next Facebook, the next Google. Not just a dream of working there, but to grow beyond that, to become the one that actually creates that technology. And because technology is very specific and very sophisticated, there are these very specific steps that I'm telling you about that you can approach. And sometime among the line, you will find your genuine idea. And when you find that idea, don't let it go. Believe it, follow it, chase it, and make it real. And let the whole world benefit from your genius, including yourself. It's a beautiful feeling. It's amazing. You are a person that is a reason for the advancement of humanity. You become the next Einstein. You become the next genius that actually pushes the world for, forward. 
So you're teaching, you're certifying. You're not just doing that, you're actually streaming your thoughts by writing. Yesterday you were feeding off of a product of someone that wrote his ideas on a book. Today you're giving back by writing towards that book. So you're writing, your, your, your audience is a mainstream where your writings just explains how to use a specific technology someone else made. And then you grow a little bit forward, so your writing actually explains your technology that you made. And then at the very end, your, your writings is approaching the future and shooting for the stars. So your writings is dreams of what technology should look like. Your books become the inspiration of those who come after you and want to take that beacon of light and move forward with it. Also, from a contribution perspective, at the very beginning you were dependent on a specific technology. Now you are independent because you're using your own technology. And then you become the innovator that actually creates something that makes everyone in the world, whether they are interested in technology or not, benefit from it. So this is how you grow. And this is the giving phase where you actually start to give back and innovate and become a gear that pushes forward the advancement of technology. Let's look at this from a higher perspective. So at the very beginning, you were the job seeker, the guy who's just looking for a job, you know, doesn't know what to do and has a lot of stuff to do. And believe me, there's a lot of things to do. In all your life as a software engineer, there will be always a lot of stuff to do. It's about whether you're actually willing to, to approach that and actually go forward with it and tackle these problems, or you just want to be, you know, some guy that actually just gets a salary and then goes home and die, basically. So you started by getting, you were getting involved, you were reading, you were getting certified, you were learning. And at some point here in the middle, innovation occurred. So you became the person that teaches, the person that certifies, the person that writes their thoughts, and the person that initiates projects. You become the job maker. Now you are the job maker. Now you are the person who invented technology. Now you are the person who is capable of having people getting certified, learning, and reading about that technology that you created and now they can approach their life the same way you did. So let's see how you grow in a team. You start by as a junior developer or entry-level developer and you work your way to become an architect. Remember that thread that I showed you earlier? You become an architect. But what happens after that? You said I become an innovator. This little unit which is a company, it becomes you. You were just a part of it. And then this whole unit, when you become an architect, you push your way up front. So you be, it becomes you. So this unit becomes your startup company. And this company uh, competes in the market with other companies. So what is a software giant and a software house? Your company here is basically using a product that some software house made. So let's take WordPress, for example. WordPress is a product, or .NET Nuke, for example. It's a product that's built on a technology like the .NET framework. A startup company basically uses, makes product that is based on the .NET Nuke. So they're making websites for people based on the .NET Nuke. You grow a little bit bigger and you become the software house that makes stuff like .NET Nuke. When you pass that level, you become the guy that makes the .NET framework or similar. You become the guy that makes technology that is as similar as the .NET framework. So these are three stages for you to grow as a corporate, as a guy that actually grows as a company that attracts people around and starts to make their own technology. So let's pass that level. When, you, when this happens, Instead, the world today has really huge big corporates 
that run really slow in the advancement of humanity. Instead of that, you become, if everyone took that plan, there will be a lot of innovator, innovators around the world, and each one of them will have their own software house and software corporate giant and whatnot. And these little wheels, they run really, really fast, that they make the world advance even faster than today. If you follow these steps, you can be one of these big wheels, big gears that actually pushes the world forward. So that's what I wanted to let you know. Believe in yourself. Follow these footsteps. I'm going to put a uh, download link for this presentation for you to download and actually take it. And let me know if you have any questions. I hope you benefit from this video. Thank you.